In the last video, we introduced the finite difference method for solving elliptic partial differential equations with Dirichlet boundary conditions. This resulted in a large number of simultaneous equations for all of the unknown mesh points. Fortunately, the matrix was symmetric and positive definite, and therefore it could be solved using the iterative Gauss-Seidel method. We could make this even faster if it were a tridiagonal matrix with three instead of five non-zero elements in most rows. To do that, we'll first rewrite the finite difference version of Laplace's equation so that all of the unknown elements in row j are on the left-hand side, and the two unknown elements corresponding to row j minus 1 and j plus 1 are moved over to the right-hand side. Then we'll rewrite it again so that all of the unknown elements in column i are on the left-hand side, and the two unknown elements corresponding to column i minus 1 and column i plus 1 are moved over to the right-hand side. This breaks the problem up into two tridiagonal systems. The piecemann rashford alternating direction implicit, or PRODI method, uses this approach. Then we arbitrarily assign initial guesses for each of the u, i, j at each interior point. And then we update row by row, solving the tridiagonal system. For each of the unknown mesh points, we keep all of the elements in the jth row on the left-hand side and move the j minus 1 and j plus 1 elements over to the right-hand side. The superscript 0 in parentheses here represents our initial guess for the values of u at these two points. The superscript 1 half on the left-hand side of the equation represents the 1 half iteration of our guesses for the unknown values of u in the jth row. We do that for each row. That system will be tridiagonal and can be solved rapidly using the Thomas method. Next, we update our guesses for u going column by column. In this case, we move the i minus 1th column and the i plus 1th column over to the right-hand side of the equal sign, and we retain the i-th column on the left-hand side of the equal sign. Now, we use the values that we obtained in the first half iteration for the values of the elements on the right-hand side of these equations, and we calculate values for each of the unknown mesh points with a superscript 1 indicating the end of the first iteration. This system of equations can also be written in a tridiagonal form, because each equation has at most only three unknowns on the left-hand side. It can therefore be solved using the Thomas method. Then we iterate, but we begin with the guesses for the values of each of our unknown elements equal to the values obtained after the first iteration. We again solve the tridiagonal system row by row and the second tridiagonal system column by column to get estimates for each of the unknown values of u from the second iteration. We continue iterating until the unknown values of u stop changing. How would this look different if instead of solving Laplace's equation, we were solving Poisson's equation? That is, the right-hand side of our initial defining equation, instead of being equal to 0, is equal to some function of x and y. The difference would be that on the right-hand sides of each of these equations, we would have some function of x and y. Of course, the Prodi method has a meaningful graphical interpretation that we'll show here. Suppose we have little n interior mesh points, and we'll arbitrarily assign initial guesses for each of the values u of ij at all of the interior mesh points. We might assign them all equal to the value 1. Then we set up a tridiagonal system for the unknown values of u at each interior mesh point, retaining the values corresponding to the jth row on the left-hand side, and moving the values corresponding to the j plus 1th and the j minus 1th rows over to the right-hand side. These values with the superscript 0 represent our initial guesses, and the values that we're solving for on the left-hand side represent the first half iteration. Once we have values for each of the unknown elements for the first half iteration, which are obtained by solving the corresponding tridiagonal system, we next update column by column. We reformulate our equations for each of the interior mesh points, retaining the values for the ith column on the left-hand side, and moving the values for the i minus 1 and i plus 1 columns over to the right hand side. We solve again a resulting tridiagonal system for the unknown values at each of the interior mesh points, and these will correspond to the values obtained from the first iteration. We use those first iteration 
values again to get the second iteration, and so forth. Now what happens if we want to solve Laplace's equation with Neumann boundary conditions instead of Dirichlet boundary conditions? For the Neumann condition, we don't know the values of our dependent variable on the boundaries of the domain. So those now become unknown points. We only know the derivatives at those points on the boundary. Now u is unknown at the exterior and the interior mesh points. That's not a problem because we can write finite difference equations at those exterior mesh points too. If we use central difference formulas, then the finite difference equations for the boundary points will include points outside of the domain. For example, when writing the second partial derivative of u with respect to y at the point u34, the formula includes the point at u33 and the point at u35, which does not exist. So we must eliminate these points that appear outside of the domain. At each point on the boundary of the domain, the Neumann condition can be used to eliminate the unknown point. We simply write a central difference formula for the first derivative centered at the point on the boundary of the domain. And we set that equal to our known Neumann condition. Then we solve for the value of this exterior point, in this case u35, and we can similarly write the central difference formula for the derivative in the x direction for these points. Again, setting those equal to the Neumann condition to solve, for example, for the value of the unknown point u53 in terms of the boundary condition and the unknown point u33. These formulas for the unknown values outside the domain, u35 and u53, can then be used to eliminate points outside of the domain in our finite difference equations for the points on the boundary. We can also write finite difference equations when our domain has irregular boundaries. For example, at the point labeled P here, the two adjacent points at A and B are not on our grid. To write the finite difference expressions for the second partial derivatives of u in the x and y directions at the point p, we need to go back to the Taylor series expansion that we used to derive the finite difference equations and recognize that our h is now no longer constant. In the x direction, for example, the step size is now alpha times h, where alpha is some fraction. When we write the Taylor series expansion around the point P to predict the value at the point M, the step size is h. But when we write the Taylor series expansion around the point P to predict the value of u at the point A, the step size is some fraction of h, which we now call alpha h. We can now multiply our equation for u of m by alpha and add the two equations. This gives us an equation that we can solve to approximate the second partial derivative of u with respect to x at the point p. Our finite difference equation for u sub xx at the point p then becomes this, which is still related to the neighboring points a and m, albeit with different coefficients than the formulas shown in the table from chapter 6. Similarly, for the derivative in the y direction, we replace the alpha with the fraction beta. In this way, we can handle irregularly shaped boundaries and still write finite difference equations. When solving elliptic partial differential equations, we use central difference formulas for the partial derivatives at each of the interior mesh points. For the Dirichlet conditions, we'll have a linear system of m times n equations, where m times n is the number of interior mesh points. We can iterate with the Gauss-Seidel, or we can write two tridiagonal systems and solve using the Prodi method, which is also iterative. The Prodi method requires that we guess values for the solution at each of the interior mesh points. We can expect either of these methods to converge. If we have Neumann conditions, then we have more equations. This time we have m times n equations plus all of the exterior mesh points so we write central difference formulas to eliminate points outside of the domain when imposing the Neumann boundary conditions, and then we solve using the same methods as we used when we have Dirichlet conditions. If we have mixed boundary conditions, we know the values of the dependent variable at some points on the boundary, but not at others. So we only need to eliminate exterior mesh points on the parts of the boundary where we have the Neumann boundary conditions. When we have irregular boundaries, 
We can still use the finite difference equations, but they need to be reformulated in order to account for a changing step size. In the next video, we'll develop numerical methods for solving parabolic partial differential equations.